Today is the 21st Sunday after Pentecost here in Los Angeles area, California. The epistle is the great list of the equipment of a soldier of Christ, taken from St. Paul's letter to the Ephesians, chapter 6. Brethren, be strengthened in the Lord and in the might of his power. Put you on the armor of God that you may be able to stand against the deceits of the devil. For our wrestling is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of the world of this darkness, against the spirits of wickedness in the high places. Therefore take unto you the armor of God, that you may be able to resist in the evil day and to stand in all things perfect. Stand therefore having your loins girt about with the truth, and having on the breastplate of justice, and, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. In all things, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you may be able to extinguish all the fiery darts of the most wicked one. And take unto you the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. The Holy Gospel taken from St. Matthew chapter 18. At that time Jesus spoke to his disciples this parable. The kingdom of heaven is likened to a king who would take an account of his servants. And when he had begun to take the account, one was brought to him that owed him 10,000 talents. And as he had not wherewith to pay it, his Lord commanded that he should be sold and his wife and children, and all that he had, and payment to be made. But that servant falling down besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. And the Lord of that servant, being moved with pity, let him go, and forgave him the debt. But when that servant was gone out, he found one of his fellow servants that owed him a hundred pence. And laying hold of him, he throttled him, saying, Pay what thou owest. And his fellow servant, falling down, besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. And he would not, but went and cast him into prison, till he paid the debt. And his fellow servants, seeing what, he was, what was done, were very much grieved. And they came and told their Lord all that was done. Then his Lord called him and saith to him, Thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all the debt because thou besoughtest me. Shouldst not thou then have had compassion also on thy fellow servant, even as I had compassion on thee? And his Lord, being angry, delivered him to the torturers until he paid all the debt. So also shall my heavenly Father do to you, if you forgive not everyone, his brother, from your hearts. Thus are the words of the Holy Gospel. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Ghost, Amen. We are in the month of November. This is when Mother Church pours out her prayers for the souls in purgatory. Every November 2nd, the priest can offer three Masses in a row for the souls in purgatory. And also these first eight days of November, you may gain a plenary indulgence for the souls in purgatory by visiting the cemetery, praying for the Pope, um, praying any prayers at a cemetery. The, the old way was six Our Fathers, six Hail Marys, six Glory Bees. And then uh, uh, communion on that day. You can make a spiritual communion when you don't have Mass. And then confession eight days before or after. So during the month of November, try. Try to visit the cemetery. Pray for the souls. Remember, you probably have family, relatives, great-grandparents, maybe great-great-great-great-grandparents who are in purgatory. Because purgatory is really a great mercy of God. 
Because think of it, nothing, says St. John, can come before God that is impure, stained, not even the slightest stain. I mean, even, even if a soul came before God with the slightest stain, it would be a torture for that person. Because they would never, he would never be at peace with God. He would always have this stain that offends God. So, if there was no purgatory, very, very few would get to heaven. Very few. But because of purgatory, souls who die in the state of grace, who may have committed many venial sins, and have a lot of dirt and grime on their soul, but not killed by mortal sin, and or mortal sins or a lifetime of mortal sins that have been forgiven, they're truly contrite, yet there's still temporal punishment due to these. Because when we offend the infinite God, it's so serious, it's so serious that there's no way to repair it. And we have this still, even in our modern liberal, everybody's equal world, in the military there's still somewhat of that rank. If a private talks back and offends his sergeant, he's going to be doing push-ups, laps, and peeling potatoes. If he talks back or is rude to his lieutenant, he's going to have double potatoes, double laps, double push-ups. If he offends the commander-in-chief, he's going to be running all day, peeling potatoes for two weeks, and doing push-ups day and night for several days. So the higher the rank, the more serious the punishment. But with God, between the highest authority on earth, the highest secular authority, which would be, in our case, the President of the United States, in the Church, it's the, the Pope, to offend them would be very serious, because they're the highest authority. Of course, today, they need more prayers, certainly the Pope, uh, to even come back to Catholic tradition and some sanity. That goes for Benedict XVI as well. He's just, he's worse of a modernist than Pope Francis. So, if you take even the highest angel, between the highest angel and Almighty God, there's an infinite dif distance. So to offend God is so grave, there's no way to repair it. But we have a chance to, thanks to God's mercy, and thanks to His merciful creation of purgatory. Because now, because of purgatory, it is a holy and wholesome thought, says the Holy Ghost in the book of Maccabees. It's a holy and so wholesome thought to pray for the dead that they be loosed from their sins. They can be loosed from their sins. They're burning, they got to pay the last penny, as our Lord says in the Gospel today. So my Heavenly Father will do to you if you don't forgive. And you'll go to purgatory and you're going to burn there until you pay the last penny. That's what he's talking about according to some of the fathers of the church. So, but thanks to purgatory, we can, many, many souls who otherwise wouldn't, will make it to heaven. But purgatory can last a long time. Purgatory can be extremely painful. And I mean painful. There's an account in Poland of a priest who, two priests, they were friends from the seminary, and they they said, whoever dies first, the other must let the other one know where he is. So, the, the, in a short story, long story made short, the, pri the priest, they both became priests. One of the priests died. And the other priest kept praying for him, at novenas and many masses, 30-day masses, and he, he had no answer. So he started to doubt the faith. He started to doubt, is there really God? Is there really purgatory? Is there really hell and heaven? So one day he was, he was finishing Mass, he was folding the corporal, and right before folding it, he folded it only once, and a hand came and put the, his hand on the corporal for a second. And that was what he saw. And the hand burnt through several layers of the cloth. And he knew that was his friend, the priest, who was in purgatory, asking prayers. So... The priest doubled his prayers and masses in the Gregorian Mass for the, his friend. And uh, 
he was released to go to heaven. So, ladies, can you, with your iron, just touch one of your towels and put a burn mark, a deep burn mark at one touch? No. Right? You'd have to hold it on there for quite a while. But imagine how hot something must be burning to, to leave a deep burn mark in wood or heavy vestments, cloth, at, at a touch. Uh, maybe I maybe my chemistry is a little off or my temperature gauge, but I think it has to be that has to be at least 450 degrees Fahrenheit to to do that at a touch. So these souls suffer, but Saint Francis de Sales says they're not in any way in despair or anguish like the damned in hell. They really are at peace and they're actually happy in the sense that. Their wills are completely conformed to God's will, and they know they're going to go home. They know this is going to end. They're going to gain the, the happiness of heaven. And when any of us, by our prayers, our rosaries, our, for our priests, the masses, our you, spiritual communions, you pray for the souls in purgatory, can you imagine the gratitude they will have when because of you thinking of them and praying for them, they're released? You have a friend forever, and they will help you with all their might in heaven and get all the saints to intercede to help you get to heaven and even escape the fires of purgatory if you can. One of the best ways to escape purgatory for us and to grow in true holiness and the love of God is, as Sister Lucia said, explaining what Our Lady meant by doing penance, is to accept our duties of state or our state of life. And for some souls, this is a great joy. They're happy to do it. It's all cut out. For some souls, their state of life can become their biggest cross, such as a young married man. Who actually, I just saw one yesterday. A young married man had a big accident, um, broke his back, and is crippled. His whole fatherhood has changed. His whole relationship with his wife and his children has changed. He can't change it. This is a cross. It was an accident. And this is his way of getting to heaven. And the answer is not to complain and to hate God because he gave me this cross. The answer is do what the saints did. Lord, I don't understand this, but I the Lord giveth, and he taketh away. Blessed be the name of God always, like Job. So some people are in a marriage that turns out sour, and you can't change it. You're married till death do you part. Some are deeply hurt by their spouse, and cast off by, especially in the modern world today, by a fake divorce. What God has put together, no man could put asunder. But how many good couples... Men or women suffer because their spouse uh, divorces from them, because they're filled with the spirit of the world and selfishness. So how many good souls suffer this? And even in religious life, even in religious life, how many good saints, like St. Saint Bernadette, was constantly tortured by, by her superior, constantly tortured and put down and humiliated. But she didn't storm out of there and say, I, well, I demand my rights. No, she humbled herself, accepted this heavy cross, and prayed for her superior, and did good to her. Or like St. Elizabeth of Portugal, her husband was a monster, and he messed with other women, and he had other children from other women, and he beat her. And her answer was not, well, I demand my rights of divorce. No. Her answer was the way of Christ. Pick up your cross and love him in return. She showered him with greater love. She cooked better meals, better dessert. She did everything she could out of love for our Lord, even though he was a despicable man. And I've said this many times, but one day the, she would always, often feed the beggars at the door. And one day uh, the Sometimes she would bring them in to lay them in the beds of the house to help them recover, clean their wounds, feed them, and give them a bath and move on. 
while there was no more beds in the house except their own. So she took the beggar, dragged him into the bed, laid him on their own bed of Mr. and Mrs. St. Elizabeth of Portugal and her husband. Her, he was actually a duke. And when he came home that night and found this out, he was furious. And he came storming to the bedroom, ripped open the curtains, and saw our Lord Jesus Christ nailed to the cross on his bed and vanished. That's when he started to change and realized, my wife, there's something to her. And that her charity was something supernatural. And that, and he began to think, my, how, how I've treated her so horribly and, and cheated on her. And her goodness, her prayers, her charity won him back and he died a holy death. She saved his soul. So sometimes we, we are in a state of life where you just can't change it and it's a, it's a terrible thorn and cross. And there are many, many cases. I could go on all night with examples. Look at so many. Someone told me the other night how the percentage of how many <clears throat> men, mostly men, but also women, who are condemned to 50, 60 years of prison unjustly. And after so many years, they find out, oh, he wasn't guilty in the long run. And they spent 50, 60 years in prison, some their whole life. And how do you explain this? Except, except God does permit evil things to happen, to make us better, to make us escape the fires of hell, so we would carry this cross out of love for God and gain heaven through it. Not throw the cross away, but the cross becomes our ladder, our ladder to climb to heaven. And all of us, in whatever state of life we're in, we're all going to have crosses. And some suffer very, very much. Some suffer less. Some people, though, you think might not suffer so much because they have, for example, a happy marriage or a happy this or a happy that. But inside, they suffer deeply from other kinds of crosses. So everyone has their crosses. And we want to just ask the grace to carry the crosses that God gives us. Because sometimes the ones we think are really heavy are actually not so heavy. Father, uh, Father Cyprian in the monastery would sometimes tell the famous story of, of, a, of a monk who goes to see the cross workshop in the workshop. And all the angels have all the crosses that God commands them to make. And so this, this monk comes in and he sees this, wow, look at that big, huge cross. Who carried that one? Well, that was St. Bernard. And look at the size of that cross. That was St. Catherine of Siena. She carried that one. And what's that other medium-sized one? Well, that was St. John Berkman. He had a short life, but he carried a big cross. And they went, she went through all the, the, this monk's, all the crosses, and the angels were explaining to him all the saints that carried them. And many crosses that people were carrying still even on earth now. So after the whole trip and tour of the cross shop, he saw these two little toothpicks on the windowsill. And he said, well, whose crosses are those? And the angel said, those are yours. <laughs> and it made him think twice how he complained, how he didn't carry his cross too well, how he always, the grass was always greener on the other side. And it made him think, wow, I'm carrying toothpicks when many are carrying bigger crosses. So let me give another little example from some great monks. These are interesting monks because these, a lot of these men chose after, often, a, some after an innocent life, some after a life of sin in their youth. They changed in their 20s and became monks, or later 30s. And these monks chose to embrace a freezing life. Listen to this. One of the most colorful of these monks, whose sensitivity brought them to high physical altitudes in search of the suffering, one of these great saints was St. Bernard de Monjou. St. Bernard de Monjou who lived from 1020 to 1081. 
So right at the part of the early Middle Ages, the ages of the faith, rather. This offspring, St. Bernard, from a rich and aristocratic family of Savoy, in spite of the allure of wealth and the offer of a marriage arranged for him by his father, decided to enter the ranks of the clergy in his native diocese of Aosta. By about the year 1040, the talented individual was already second in command of the diocese. However, when he realized that paganism and nominal Catholicism were still rampant among the Alpine dwellers in, and in Lombardy, up in the mountains of the Alps, with that restless ardor of, of the true pastor of souls, he began preaching throughout the region and continued to do so for roughly 40 years, bringing about many conversions. In his diocese, there was an alpine pass, a pass way up in the mountains that travelers would go through, and they still do today. This pass that connected the valley of Aosta to the Swiss area of the Valais. And the Valais was, one, was a great Catholic country before the Vatican II smashed it. <clears throat> so this pass in the mountains, whose highest point is at 8,000 feet above sea level, was at times covered in snow about seven feet deep and with drifts of up to 40 feet. Pilgrims traveling to Rome through the pass were at risk from the heavy snowstorms in winter and the avalanches in spring. So here I am talking to Californians <laughs> about snow. Well, I grew up in snow, and yes, it can be treacherous. Every year, snowmobilers fall through the ice. Every year, um, ice fishermen bring their trucks onto the ice, which is fine in the January, February, but March, late March, they start melting. And some of them misjudge the ice and they fall through. And many die every year this way. So winter has its fun and, uh, and beauty, but it also has its treach treacherous uh, side to it. And this is what is happening in this past. So what happens? The enterprising St. Bernard of Montju, that's M O T. M-O-N-T-J-O-U, Montjou, St. Bernard of Montjou, decided to do something about this. He built a hospice at what is now known as the Great St. Bernard Pass, and he founded a community of monks dedicated to the care of the travelers. From then on, thanks to this diocesan priest of Aosta, A-O-S-T-A, the fire of Christ-like love blazed amid snow-covered alpine peaks. For a thousand years, no matter the season, no matter the hour, exhausted and freezing travelers knew they could rely on the chivalrous canons of the congregation of the great St. Bernard. Hence, the dogs. And you can see paintings of these monks coming out to the mountains with their staff and their hoods on and surrounded by... St. Bernard dogs with flasks of fresh wine to warm the travelers because wine warms the body so they don't freeze to death by hypothermia. So this went on for a thousand years. Accompanied during centuries by their huge well-trained dogs named after the daring founder, St. Bernard. Symbolic of this millennium-old commitment is the fact that the main entrance of the hospice remains unlocked day and night. The self-sacrifice of the youths who knocked at the doors of this congregation of monks in order to dedicate their lives to be Christ's watchmen on the, on the Alpine heights is astounding. These heroes of the Alps lived in a grim building beside a lake frozen every year, frozen 265 days of the year. Californians don't like to hear that. Where the icy winds of winter do not halt for eight months of the year. Where for centuries, each winter morning during this holy sacrifice of the Mass, the water to be added to the wine was only brought to the altar from the one heated room of the building 
immediately before the consecration to avoid the water freezing. Where day after day, no matter how harsh the weather, these monks sent out search parties for travelers in danger and tirelessly cared for the tired, the sick, and all needing shelter. The valor of such men as Saint Bernard or Saint Bernard of Monjou is relatively well chronicled. What is far less known is the lifestyle of the ordinary priests who during that era spent their lives in parishes. So um, so the monks of Saint Bernard of Monjou, this is how many men changed their life, gave their life to God, and they would get, dedicate it to helping travelers and feeding them and taking care of them. And some of them would get wounded, some of them would come close to death, hypothermia, etc., etc., going over the pass of the mountains. I don't know if you've ever traveled in, in snow, but uh, if travelers are not careful, the snow can get into their boots, can get into their socks, and if it's really blizzarding out, they can get it into their chest and back. Snow comes in. And once it gets wet and it's windy and cold, you start shivering. The body temperature goes way down and, and you're in danger of hypothermia. And hypothermia is a cause of death every year. Every year. Uh, one 16-year-old football player in Rathdrum Mountain was snowboarding with his friend they were in t-shirts and their pants because it was warm on the mountain. But once the sun goes down, they're cold. And his friend went to the truck. He, he was waiting and waiting for his other friend. He didn't come and he went to find him. His other friend had died. 16-year-old football boy, football player, froze to death from hypothermia. So it does happen. So these monks, that was their, their carrying of their cross every day. And you can bet there was a lot of suffering in such a life, freezing to death and, um, and then dealing with, you know, all, where there's people, there's problems, of course. So not all the pilgrims were all that friendly either. So, so just to show an example of these, these heroic souls who carried their cross every day. And by doing that, you can do it in such a way that when you die, you will go straight to heaven. That's what we want to aim for. To do all out of love for God so that when we do die, we don't have to pass through purgatory. And that's possible by a perfect act of contrition, by an ever-increasing love of God and living in the state of grace always, and a great love and devotion to the Virgin Mary. So let's pray for the souls in purgatory in this month. And let's remember our Lord is merciful, but he's also just. And he will demand that the last penny be paid. So let's try as best we can to, to diminish and obliterate all venial sins in our life. So we don't commit deliberate venial sins. Because these are more serious than we think. And sometimes we Catholics, especially cradle Catholics, take this lightly. But venial sins, they're not as deadly as mortal sins, but they still offend God. They still sicken the soul. They still weaken the will and blind. So we want to make war from all mortal sin and against all venial sin and truly run in the love of God with the armor that St. Paul described today the sword of the Spirit, girt with the Catholic truth. And the Archbishop Lefebvre was one of these champions of our time who fought girt with the truth. And defending the truth brought him suspension by the one we would never expect to punish Catholic tradition and try to expel it, the Pope himself, Pope Paul VI, and then Pope John Paul II with his phony excommunication. And that was a great cross for Archbishop Lefebvre to suffer this so unjustly from these men who should be defending Catholic tradition. And things now are much worse, much worse right now. And this is not the time to be seeking agreements with modernist Rome and compromising, but that's, that's already long done 
since 2012 for the for the conciliar SSPX. Pray for them all. It's a frightening step, and the punishment for it is blindness. So do pray for them, especially all the priests, good priests, to wake up and realize this, the real stand of Archbishop Lefebvre. He always said the greatest danger is to put ourselves under modernist Rome and under these modernist bishops because by their games and by their policies and negotiations and their giving of crumbs of Latin mass, they will make you lose the faith and they will crush tradition. And that's, they've been successful with many groups who fell under their uh, false obedience to them. So hold fast to the Catholic faith, little flock. This suffering of our time, this warfare for the faith, is one of our penances. And through this we will gain sanctity in heaven. O Mary conceived without sin. O Mary conceived without sin. O Mary conceived without sin. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.